Hi, I'm Donna Murphy, and you're listening to You Might Know Her From with Anne and Damien. So last time we did this whole shebang, I was very drunk. We had plans to meet <laughs> and record and I like you came over and like I have to be I don't have a per- drinking problem, but I was out that day. So I feel like fine <laughs> admitting this on the record. I don't remember recording. <laughs> I remember us starting and we recorded for like 40 minutes and the first <laughs> 10 minutes I was like, none of this is usable. This is not usable. And then I was like, should we stop? And you were like, I think let's just keep going, <laughs> which is usually you're the person that's like, is this good? It's usually you that is asking that question. <laughs> question not me and I'm like this is great this is good content you were like no 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 let's keep going I was like you're wasted that's when I realized it I didn't (laughs) know that you were until that moment well I'm very sorry folks but uh, I'm gonna throw to Anne and let her start because I remember last time I was like did you ever see the chemistry between Leisha Haley and I was like that's how I opened the episode so like what what a joke to be honest you know not everything can be pearls it can't all be diamonds (laughs) but welcome back to another episode of you might know her from with Anne and Damien if you are familiar with the show you know that Damien and I are longtime best friends and collaborators who shoot the shit and talk about the comings and goings and pop culturisms of our life what we're consuming what we hate this month and we interview an actress each episode and so we're excited to be back here this month to do the whole thing with you So I have a whole list because as you know, we're monthly. So I have to like keep track when things happen, when important things so that I don't forget it when it's time to record. So I'm just going to run through a couple of things because a lot has occurred. First of all, we lost Burt Bacharach and Raquel Welch this month. Rest in peace. Okay. First of all, I can't believe that I didn't hear this from you because it's one of your favorite shows. And somebody that is still with us and still alive was revealed on the show to be none other than Dick Van Dyke. And I didn't see the episode. I just saw the follow up on like Entertainment Tonight Twitter or something. I was like, what in the actual fuck? God bless this man's fountain of youth. I'm so sorry to say that I fell off the mass Singer. That is shocking. Yeah, they were just like doing, I don't like, there was like... They've just been having everybody on politicians with questionable politics. So I was like, you know what? I'm on it. I'm good. But the other day I was watching something on the DVR and it stopped and like it went to regular TV and it was on and I didn't move. Oh, maybe it was after the Super Bowl. I don't remember, but I didn't move. And so I watched and then I watched them and they were like, Dustin Hoffman. This is Dustin Hoffman. We have an Oscar winner. And uh, what's Alan Thicke's son's name? Robin Thicke. Robin Thicke was like... I know Dustin Hoffman's son, and so I know, and I know that voice, and that is Dustin Hoffman. And then, of course, the reveal was that it was Dick Van Dyke. And then our girl, uh, you might know her from in my book, you might know her from Dirty Dancing, the remake, you might know her from Pop Stars on the (laughs) WB, you might know her as voice number 27 in Moana, Nicole Scherzinger is weeping and she is like you are an icon and you look so handsome and i was like yes he is so sexy he can still get it he can still get it for both of us honestly he always could it makes me love nicole scherzinger because honestly i think that those were probably real tears because i think having seen that clip of her with those 17 phantoms of the opera (laughs) uh It's one of my favorite things of all time. So anyway, that was one thing. The other thing I wanted to tell you is, first of all, Punxsutawney Phil's like compatriot New Jersey died. I don't know if you care. But the other thing I wanted to tell you is that, did you know that Warren Beatty released this really, really weird video on AMC like two weeks ago? No. Okay, so I learned this whole backstory. So Warren Beatty who I like used to love. I'm not sure I do. I think he and Annette Bening have a trans child. And my understanding is that Annette has been super supportive and Warren hasn't. So it's a strike in my book Mm -hmm. for Warren Beatty. But I have a soft spot for him in his film career, period, not his personal life. But he owns the intellectual property to Dick Tracy, which I didn't know. And that's how he got the film made. So apparently... He is IP squatting, which means that he has basically 
Every 12 or 13 years, he has to do something with the character or he relinquishes the right to it. So like 12 years ago, he filmed this like weird thing that was like an interview with Ben Mankiewicz or something on AMC and like released it at midnight so no one would see it. And it's like a 20 minute thing that is like technically called a sequel. And he did it again like two weeks ago and he's wearing the fucking yellow Dick Tracy hat and the (laughs) yellow jacket and like talking about Zoom and how he was like, I didn't even know that the technology could get beyond my watch and now here we are talking to each other on zoom and it's like him and the two hosts of amc like at the movies or whatever <laughs> and he's the he li- it like literally is technically legally called a quote-unquote sequel which means he retains the right to dick tracy's film rights for like another 12 to 13 years in which case he'll be like 107 but Bless. i do i actually really respect what he's doing because he doesn't want anybody else to have the right i love to he it. loves dick love tracy it. that much he loves it. And it's also like Dick Tracy, I think, is like a fucking nightmare cop, essentially. And he's like a he's like a left wing. I don't know that he's really that progressive, but, you know, he's like a lefty in Hollywood. So I love the dissonance of all of it. But the fact that he's like, it's true that like if Marvel got their hands on it somehow or DC or Disney, that they would make some horrible thing that was totally whitewashed. And I love the Dick Tracy movie and it made me love Warren Beatty. That is so cool. I really want to see that. Please post it in the show notes so we can all find it. I most definitely will. Oh, she's going down our list. I'm watching her. She's checking it. I have like seven. I have 17 other things. So I was giving a breath in case you wanted to share something from your own life. You just had a birthday. I just had a birthday. And wow, what it is to become older. Uh, I saw Parker Posey on stage for my as one of my birthday treats to myself. You did have an opinion on it that you didn't share with me because I'm seeing it in like two weeks And I appreciate your attempt, but but your friend Kelly was like, told me your opinion on it, which I thought was really charming. Yes, Parker was great. It was so great to see her on stage. And love her so much. I love her so much. And yeah, I was so so happy to see her. And yeah, what I mean, I don't know. I don't know what birthdays are such a strange thing. You know, I love attention. So it's like not like I don't want to do (laughs) things for my birthday. But the older I get, I feel weirder about doing things because I'm like, I'm all about wanting to include people. But then it starts to feel stressful. And like, I don't want people to feel obligated. So anyway, my birthday was lovely, though. So I got to see Parker Posey. And then I got to, you know, drink vodka sodas at my favorite dive bar and have Indian food with dear friends. And it was all just Perfectly lovely and fun, and I got to hear music on a jukebox, including the Foo Fighters at a gay bar. It was troubling. Do you remember that? Of course. It was like, I was like, yeah, look, I have no problem with the Foo Fighters. I loved, Nirvana's still like my favorite band of all time, quote unquote. You know what I mean? I love Dave Grohl, but I just thought it was odd that this dive bar in Hell's Kitchen is playing ever long. Just like, it's a good song. Do I need to hear it there? I don't. Also, after you left, this man was like talking to us and I don't remember what about. And I was like, oh, yeah. And he is like, my name is Mitt. And he was like, and we were like, like Mitt Romney. And he was like, no, like a baseball Mitt. And then I was like, oh, yeah. (laughs) He didn't know who Mitt Romney was. And he was like, I was talking to one of your friends earlier. And I was like, oh, yeah, it was Anne. She said, you look like Orion's story. And he was like, she said, I look like Orion's story. And I was like, yeah. (laughs) And then he was like, that's an insult. And I was like, no, you're cute. And then... I realized he was more traditionally handsome than Orion Story. He was. Also, it was clear to me ten minutes later after he was hanging with us for a while. I like looked over and I was like, "Oh, that his friend had those bangs, like the Callista Flockhart in Con bangs," and that was Orion Story. <laughs> so I told Mitt he looked like Orion Story, but he didn't at all. But I was like, "Yeah, Ann said you look like Orion Story." <laughs> He was one of the people that stopped me because I was wearing a Spice Girl sweatshirt. And I said, oh, I'm so glad you did. What we're doing currently is ranking them from best singer to worst singer. Give me a ranking. That's interesting. And Let's- he was on it. He was on it. He or- Fake Orion Story, not Mitt, but Fake Orion Story had the details down. Obviously, Mel C, top of the list. He said sporty. I said, yes, Mel C, obviously, we all know is number one. There's no question there. Where it gets hazy is two three. Two three is hazy. Yeah. Who, what do y'all think of the of the top five? Like the the ranking of their vocals. Yeah, we're gonna post our top five online, and you can engage with it. Please let us know because I think one and five are extremely clear. Oh, <laughs> I totally agree. Five is the worst. Well, speaking of <laughs> engaging online, also something maybe worth mentioning is we created a you might know her from Instagram, and you know people always are like you need to promote the things more with this podcast, and we're like okay, it's like hard <laughs> to do it. Like the show <laughs> is the priority. All of the other shit is also hard. Then on top of like right. we're, we're proud of the product. But then we were like, we had a clip night the other night where we were just watching musical theater clips. And we we were like looking at old photos of somebody. I don't remember what sparked this, but we were like, you know what? Let's just start an Instagram. So it's not necessarily like just 
show promotion. It's really just like actress promotion. It's like all, it's like basically what Anne and I do in the, our day to day of like, look at this photo of like Bette Midler with a typewriter on uh, like hat, or like look at this great clip of like Carmen de Lavala dancing to the Austin Powers theme. So we're just sharing pictures, videos, sort of like pulling from the archive. Some of the women have been guests. Some of the women are you know no longer with us. And then some aspirational of the, guests, exactly. So find us on Instagram at you might know her from, and you can sort of like see the things. And uh, yeah, it be another way to be in touch with us, please. And while we're doing a little bit of housekeeping, Anne, what else do we, something we haven't done in like the last six months, <laughs> we should ask for reviews. We should. Folks, you know the drill. Really, the thing that helps us the most and helps this podcast get in more people's ears is if you leave a five star review on the Apple Podcast app. I know everybody listens on different platforms, but if you can please go to the Apple Podcast app right now, please leave a five star review. Leave us an actress name, leave us a shrimp emoji, leave us a body talk topic. You know the hits of this hit parade. Let us know. If you have a less than five star review, please don't leave a review. <laughs> Just keep it to yourself. It would do us such a solid if you did that so thank you so much and also thank you to the longtime listeners who have been dropping reviews i see you louis thank you so much thanks louis you know what i love i love i love king louis song from the jungle book uh i'm the king oh. of the jungle it's by louis prima famous italian american you I mean just, the one that's like i'm the king of the jungle me the vip vip it's so good <laughs> I listen to it. I listen to Louis, Louis Prima all the time. And um, when Same. I was home for Christmas Eve, I was playing a lot of Louis Prima because I associate him with like being at Italian weddings as a kid. So like I associate him with my mom and she was like, please stop asking Alexa to play that. I don't like Louis Prima. And I was like, wow. <laughs> Noted. And then she, Wait, what? And then, oh, Alexa's not talking to me. Stop. That's terrifying. That's terrifying. Yeah. My mom said she doesn't like Louis Prima. And then she asked the robot to play Kelly Clark's. <laughs> I love Patty. She is just an anomaly. My favorite thing about your mother, I mean, there's so many things to love, but one of them is just her brutal honesty. And the second thing is the fact that she was dressed up as mini me for Halloween one year <laughs> with her boss, who was Dr. Evil. She put on a bald cap for a work Halloween party. She's the I best think she's, yeah, it's, Tell me if this is correct. I think she slept with the bald cap on because <laughs> I think it was like so time consuming and she needed help with it. And because she had to, I'm going to confirm with her tonight, but folks, I think my mother <laughs> slept with her bald cap on. Also, she's like prone to migraines. Like why she would ever do that, I don't know. But it's cool. Again, it's cool. It's the commitment. To also, she oh, hates Halloween. God. She hated Halloween for like 60 years. And then that got a job in her in her golden years where she like people were into Halloween and she had to participate. And she was like, this is supposed to be a fun job, not like my real job, but I hate Halloween. And then she was dressing up as Minnie and me. God love her. <laughs> God love her. I love her so much. Another person that I love is this month's guest. And I have to tell you, we were so excited when we landed theater legend, two-time Tony winner, none other than Miss Donna Murphy, who, if you are in the tri-state area, if you were interested in flying to New York for a visit for spring break, she is doing something really exciting at the end of March. She's starring in Dear World, the Jerry Herman, Angela Lansbury vehicle, which is like a lesser known show with a beautiful score. She's starring in it at New York City Center, and it is, whew, I have my tickets. I'm so excited. She is, for me, I think just top tier talent. And so the fact that we got to sit down and chat with her on You Might Know Her From is a big deal. We've been courting her for a while. We're big fans from a number of arenas, which you will get to hear in the interview. And she is just a person. She has this quality that I think is exactly right for the podcast. And for me, a lot of times we talk to actors and they like to talk about craft and they take the work really seriously, but they don't take themselves seriously. Mm. And I think that's what Donna Murphy has in spades. And for me, it's the exact right formula not just for like a guest of the show, but just in terms of the kind of people that I'm drawn to. I want you to be super serious about your craft and have details. Like I remember we were talking to Anna Maria Horsford and she was talking about the work she was doing in that scene in Grey's Anatomy. Like I think about that, I think about the way she works and I think that's how Donna Murphy works too. Just like really a student of acting that also likes to have a good time. I think and that's a great way to encapsulate Donna Murphy in. Bye, bye, bye. You might know her from The Gilded Age, Tangled, Center Stage, Spider-Man 2, and Broadway productions of Wonderful Town, The King and I, Hello Dolly, and Passion. We are back, and we are sitting here with 
actor, singer, and two-time Tony winner, Donna Murphy. Donna, I can't tell you how excited we are to be with you. We have been waiting for this day, truly, for, like, years. (laughs) Well, um, I remember... (laughs) I'm a, you, I'm a speechless, Damien. We scared you off uh, right away. <laughs> no, I I was aware that you guys had, you know, <laughs> extended an invitation. And I'd listened to your show, and I loved it. I just loved the whole vibe of the conversations and the joy that you guys have together. Oh, I'm sure, I, I, I hope independently as well, but together you just really are a great team and the conversations just really engaged me. And so I knew I wanted to do it. It just was, you know, it's all about timing, folks. Yes, yes, it's yes. It's all about time. We know you're busy, so we're so happy that you made time for us today. So thank you. Thank and you. And we're so happy because you're having a moment right now. You're so glorious as Mrs. Astor in the, in the Julian <laughs> Fellows HBO series, The Gilded Age. And I think one of the things we love about the show so much is that it's like chock full of New York theater actors uh, and everyone's like in these incredible period costumes. And it's about the clash between old and new money and like the new New York City and you are the keeper of high society. And like everyone's talking about Mrs. Astor all season. So can you tell us specifically about filming that ball scene in the finale where you and Carrie Coon like finally square off in front of the entire cast and everyone's in like tuxes and hoop skirts? It was a blast. We had fun on so many levels. And even though there were a lot of, you know, very, very long days in very uncomfortable, beautiful, but uncomfortable (laughs) costumes, we all were just so happy to be working together and working on something that everybody was really putting their best foot forward. And But people had a great sense of humor about yeah. many aspects of the circumstances. Well, like you said, it's like chock full of these theater actors, but also nobody had been doing theater for a while. Yeah. So I think at final count, there's 17 Tonys among the female cast members. <laughs> there would be more if we included the men like Bill Irwin and Nathan Lane, but we're not going to. So you and Kelly O'Hara actually have Tonys for playing the same role <laughs> on Broadway, Anna and the King and I. Did you guys compare like theater notes and talk shop while you were filming or you were just like, no, this is like we're in it right now in Rhode Island together? No, we definitely talk shop. I mean... Because we have all that in common. And it's like we'd all been stranded on individual desert islands, you know, during this time. And so, and being in period costume, you know, Kelly and I would talk about what was different about this period, what was harder about this corset or these dancing in these gowns. We would compare notes about, well, you know, my ball gown weighed like, 43 pounds from the waist down. Really? Well, my whole dress weighed like 62 pounds. Well, well, you know what? I'm being a little silly, but th- this was true. We would talk about that. Yeah. And we all had so many stories and some that we, we shared going in. I'd worked with quite a few of these actors before. I remember we were shooting at, it was like a music hall upstate that was playing for an opera scene. And... Christine Baranski said, oh, my God, I think I did Private Lives up here. (laughs) I think I played Private Lives on that stage. (laughs) And I can't remember if later on she said, oh, no, it wasn't this. It was another one in the area. But but she was like, really? So she was telling us stories about that. Nathan, of course, has as many unbelievable stories as you might imagine he might have. And we talked about what was going on also amongst our peers who were not working, people who were working on other shows. Like I I was working on another show concurrently uh, on Gossip Girl, which just just did a few episodes the first season. And then I had done another like Netflix show. And so everybody was comparing notes about what the protocols were on these different shows. So there was a lot of conversation about that. And the conversation about just what people were going through, you know, and how people had been dealing with it how we were dealing with it now. The protocols on this show were off the charts in terms of the testing. I mean, they came to my house to do PCR tests before any fitting, before any, any, excuse me, any contact other than virtual. They just were amazing. And then you would test that same day. 
you'd have a rapid and a PCR taken that morning. There were some there was some kind of a rapid PCR. They really looked yeah. out and still there were cases. You know, and in show yeah. in these show in a show like that, which is you know, it's an expensive show and and losing a leading player on any given day, well you're kind of up shit's creek, right? But yeah. these I have to say, our producers were amazing in dealing with you know, the practical challenges of it all. Mm -hmm. So it's really something. Okay, Donna, bear with me because I just need to tell you, like I saw the 2003 revival of Wonderful Town three times. This was directed by Kathleen Marshall. It was a spectacular show. You, of course, played the Roz Russell role of Ruth Sherwood, who moves from Ohio to New York City with your sister Eileen, played by Jennifer Westfeld. So I wanted to get into the nitty gritty of this. You're one of your big numbers, 100 Easy Ways to Lose a Man. This is a great song. And I think actually I would think it's a hard song to sing because it's similar to You Can't Get a Man with a Gun from Annie Get Your Gun in that like we know each verse is sort of this anecdote with a joke about you being bad with men but you have to keep the audience surprised because otherwise you get tired of the joke so what I loved about your rendition is you have this really specific setup and punchline for each anecdote and in for our listeners if you haven't seen it please go watch we're going to link out to it but can you tell me like was that different each night or was it choreographed with Kathleen down to like each punch of the hand and squinted eye the first time I ever heard this song I saw it performed was Betty Comden Mm. did it at a fundraiser that I did and we were both on the bill and she was my god she was probably 70 years old or older I can't do the math right now and she like just stepped out and nailed it and I I think if she did anything she like raised an arm turned a head it was just all in the language and the timing and she was perfection but this was a different situation I'm a different person and so I had a lot of ideas that I presented to Kathleen. And she said, oh, I love that. And maybe if you do that, then maybe this. So it, it was a little bit different each night because also timing. Hello. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it's, it's a comedy number. And so the audience responses were different every night. And of course, that's what we love about live theater. And there were things that I would discover. Oh, if I, you know, you, you extend something a little bit or, or you, I forget to do something that, and then I realize, oh, by forgetting to do that, then this thing landed even bigger. I thought I had to set it up with this, but no, in fact, this became less expected. So those happy accidents that happened. But I'll tell yeah. you, like, it was maybe five years or seven years after I'd done this show, and I was doing, it was a drama league honoring, it was like their gala benefit, and they were honoring Roger Berlin, who was a producer of the late great Roger Berlin a real gentleman producer and he was one of our producers and so I'd been asked to sing they were having people perform songs from shows he produced and so I'd been asked to sing that number because it was a favorite of his and he was there beforehand I was kind of going I mean I had a rehearsal but then I was going through it in the air in the green room we were all in and Jimmy Naughton was up there amongst us, the wonderful James Naughton. And I said, you know, I've got this moment where I have her, she's at a baseball game and she's, I've decided she's eating popcorn, you know, while she's sitting next to the guy. And I, I said, I just feel like it's missing. I, I want to give it one other beat. And he goes, why don't you throw a piece of that popcorn up in the air and catch it with your mouth? And I was like, yeah, cause I can't miss it. <laughs> it's, in, it's invisible. Oh, right. It was. And so it was like it just it just grew another step because Jimmy had a brilliant idea and I had an impulse that I felt like, oh, I just there's just something missing there. So I don't know. Comedy comedy should keep growing. You, you want to keep, you know, if you're doing a show eight times a week, there's certain things you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and you want to have yeah. a certain amount of consistency. But I do love the chance to just see what happens tonight. It's so good. One of the things Damien and I do is we always look for like when our guest has played gay or gay adjacent. So look, I know Mm. that Ruth and Eileen are sisters, Midwestern sisters at that, but there is gay energy in that show. And at one point in that number, you sing to show him where his grammar errs, then mark your towels, hers and hers. And you give this like nod to the audience. So Donna Murphy, tell us about that gay moment. Well, I just said, why can't I have some fun with this? Why can't, it's like you considered it for a second yeah, and you said no. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly what I played because I'm like, she's not doing so well with guys. She 
has a great relationship with her sister. She probably gets <laughs> along, well, I won't say generally with women, because she probably had her trouble with, you know, certain kinds of women being friends to just, because she's so damn smart and she doesn't hide it. And it was at a time when that, you know, historically it was not necessarily the most appreciated quality in a woman, uh, yeah. being the smartest person in the room. Mm-hmm. So I just said, I, I don't think I even said it. I think I just did it one night. It was like, because she they wrote the line. The I mean, Betty and Adolf wrote it, you know, but that I just did it once and it was like hers and hers. I'm like, hmm, not a bad, oh no, I'm not going to go that way. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I'm glad you remember that. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. It's really good. <laughs> Okay, Dunham, you play Mother Gothel in 2010's Tangled, Disney's adaptation of the Rapunzel story, where you get the great scenery chewing number Alan (laughs) Menken penned song, Mother Knows Best. It's an incredible performance. It's like so fun, but also very complex. I I love it. And you said that you sang Last Midnight from Into the Woods for your audition for Tangled. So can you tell us, like, how grueling was this Disney villain audition process? Like, was it shrouded with secrecy? And what's the best Disney perk you got out of the whole gig? Okay. So first of all, I get the call about the audition. I'm like, oh, my God. Fantastic. I've had, I had not had many auditions for animated things. And I'd almost gotten one that had not happened. So they give me a character description. And they said they're looking for a Joni Mitchell song. And I'm like, what? So I am going crazy with my Joni Mitchell songbooks, thinking about how I can, because I don't want to just, when I go in to sing for somebody, I never think about, here, you're going to hear my voice. I think about, I I want to give them a sense of the character in song and how might this character sing. So I am like twisting and distorting, you know, everything from, wildflowers to both sides now, you know, to try to come up with a way to give a suggestion of what I might do vocally with this character. But something just did not seem right. And so I met Alan many, many years ago when I was a vacation cover for uh, Audrey in Little Shop of Horrors in the original production. We're in New York, folks. Can you hear (laughs) us? Love Sorry. it. You're beating We're, us to the punch, Donna. That's You're beating right. us to the punch. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's good. Did Alan like do a favor there? Did he no, was like No so no, so I didn't know him well enough to call him or reach out to him, but I remember that my friend James the Pine, who I'm very close with, who was our writer and director of Passion and a play I did, Twelve Dreams, of course, Sondheim's collaborator on Into the Woods and Sunday in the Park with George. He's a genius. And I'm lucky. He's my friend. And I called James and I said, listen, I've got this audition. It's important. Blah, blah, blah. Could you ask Alan if, in fact, they're looking for the people auditioning for Mother Gothel to sing a Joni Mitchell tune? And I hear back from James and he said, no, they want a classic, like, show tune. I'm like, that's a little different. And I don't know what what got screwed up, but I'm not trying to be blameful because I had my agent or manager, whoever it was at the time, go back to casting, but it just kept coming back. Nope, Joni Mitchell, Joni Mitchell. Well, Joni Mitchell, later when I talked to Alan about it, he's like, I don't know how that happened. That's what we were asking for. We were suggesting for the Rapunzel auditions. They wanted a, a folky you know, okay. light, flexible, you know, uh, Joni yeah. Mitchell type of instrument and approach to fo- fo- the material. So thank God I got that straightened out. And I didn't have that much time to prepare. And I was thinking, oh, well, shit. I mean, it's Mother Gothel. It's it's Rapunzel. Not that I had sung Last Midnight because I had never sung it at that point. But I started taking a look at it and I started having some ideas, not about doing it exactly as it's usually done. And we just, I went to my friend, Larry Yerman, who's a wonderful music director and pianist and arranger. And we created this arrangement that was kind of interesting and crazy. And it was definitely Mother Gothel singing that song. And so that's what I sang. And I had that audition. I was told it went, they felt like it went great. And then I didn't hear anything for months. 
And I was told, oh, there's some big changes happening. And I thought, oh, they're like writing this character out or they're just, that's just, you know, code for Angelica Houston is doing it or you know, <laughs> Cher is doing it or something. And then I heard back, they said they, they'd like you to come in again and they don't want you to change a thing. Just, you know, come back in. There's some script changes and, and there had been some changes just in, how they were approaching the production. So I did that. And shortly thereafter, I was told I had the offer. And I was shocked. I was convinced that they would get somebody who was a more recognizable name value, you know, in the broader sense of the word. But I also felt like I had just hit the jackpot. Disney had been a huge part of my life growing up, you know, watching the wonderful world of Disney and going to Disney, you know, films as as a kid and and then with my stepdaughter and my and my youngest daughter you know introducing her to disney and disney films particularly the you know the films both the early classics and then the renaissance that that howard ashman and alan mankin were really responsible for so i have a million stories about that but that's that would be three episodes (laughs) <laughs> but it was just, I had the most delicious time. Do you think that, like, there is any connection between you playing Mother Gothel that, like, influenced, like, the powers that be Then, then, like, two years later, I think, you played the witch in Into the Woods? Like, do you think there was anything there? Well, you would think, one would think, right? I, here's what I know. I auditioned for the original production of Into the Woods for the witch, I was quite young. It was for the Broadway production. They'd already done it out of town with with an actress. They'd already workshopped it with another actress. They probably were in negotiations with Bernadette, is my guess. I don't know. Or maybe Bernadette didn't know if she was available. But that's another long story. But I had several callbacks. I worked with James. And I was given the direction at that time, we don't want a Disney witch. We want a really scary presence and energy Mm. on that stage. And the feedback that came back after my final audition was, she was a little too dark. (laughs) I love that. It's all a little too dark. (laughs) And James swears he doesn't remember any of this. But then, like, I was then called in about a year later to audition to replace Joanna Gleason. So interesting. And I remember taking the bus down from Williamstown, where I was doing a new musical, to audition for that. And... You know, I wore like a, what I would call like a, a peasant skirt, you know, at the time, yeah. like a flowy skirt and, and a kind of like peasant blouse and just put my hair up in a messy bun kind of thing. Whereas when I auditioned for The Witch, I had like a black cat suit on and like this red sheer flowing kimono thing and my hair, which was permed and layered and looked like, I don't know, some crazy would be rock and roller, just, you know, it, it was a, just a main. So I looked very, very different. And I had a face full of makeup for the first and no makeup on, you know, for the second. And so the feedback for, from that, and I thought that went great. And I got to read with Chip Zion and, and Chip was like, oh my God, who are you? This is, you're so wonderful. That he was very complimentary. And the feedback was, she was fantastic. And we were all so happy to see that she put on a little bit of weight it's like, I weigh the same. I just had like skinny black clothes on and then like gray and white flowy baggy clothes on. I, you know, it's just whatever. Also, just like, is that helpful feedback? Honestly, no, what to do no, that? that was just so like, <laughs> why are you even talking about that? But right. yeah, um, don't tell me that. And, and then, and because really the, the bottom line was we're going with somebody we've worked with. And it was, I think it was, <laughs> it was, it was Mary Gordon Murray, I think first replaced. Okay. And Mary had done one of the revivals of Merrily We Roll Along that I did not get. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but so there's that back story. And then when I got the call about the park, about the production at the Delacorte, the directing team were British and they had done it at St. Regent's Park, I think it's called in London. Mm-hmm. And actually that minimally talented little tiny human Hannah Waddingham played the witch there. Right. Right. I mean, she's just, she's so brilliant and so wonderful. So she played the witch there and 
these guys, they were not planning on bringing anybody over, but they, they were going to do this production outside and they had their own concept about the piece and the character of the witch. And I remember the meeting with the director and he said, so I've never seen your work. I said, okay. He said, but then I did, I realized, oh, I did see one of your things. I just didn't realize it was you. I saw you do the show, The People in the Picture, which was at the Roundabout Theater. And I thought, yeah. interesting to draw from that, that you think I might be a suitable wit- actress to play the witch. Because I played a woman who we saw from like in her 30s to her mid 80s, who was a Holocaust survivor, but she had been an actress in um, Yiddish filmmaking in Poland and then came to the States. So, so we, we see saw her as a young woman and an older woman. The reason that he was struck with me being somebody that he might he could see playing the witch is that all of my transitions were mostly mostly made on stage physically. Mm. I mean, I did have costume changes and wig changes at certain points, but at other moments I didn't. And I would be dressed as the old woman and I would become the younger woman. I would be dressed as the and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And it was all in my body and voice work. And so he said that they had been experimenting with this character, that the spell that had been put on her was that she, the, the mother had, had put a spell on her that she was going to become part of the wood. She was becoming a tree that would eventually mm-hmm. become sort of petrified in the forest. He said, and we need somebody who really can embrace that physical life and there's things that we'd like to take further than what we did in London and elements of the transformation that happened that we're not sure how we want to handle but we'd like to know we have an actress who could help us with how that happens so that's why I'm sure I was on a list of a lot of you know qualified women who would be wonderful and however I ended up being pitched and then him realizing, oh, I don't, I don't really know her, but I did see her in this. I mean, won't go into that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so that's how I ended up. And it sounded fascinating to me. It was, you know, I don't think it was completely successful in what it was trying to do. But the chance to play that role and the chance to play it, I remember saying to Steve, you know, I had become over the years so trusting of things happening when you're when you're ready really ready to bring just something valuable to it. And by that time, you know, I was a mother. Uh, I had lost my father. I had just been through different kinds of human experiences that very different from the whatever 29-year-old or something who auditioned that just really helped me bring a fuller characterization to the work. And I loved getting to do it just loved it i love that well that director lacked a little bit of tact perhaps but at least he recognized your physical work which i think a lot of people do so you know sort of in that vein Mm. you of course won your first tony for playing fosca and sondheim's 1994 musical passion Mm. a show about how love can be both you know obsessive and also transformative Mm. this role was just incredibly demanding can you describe the physical and emotional toll that playing this sort of devastation eight times a week singing literally from a sick bed, like, took on you? You know what's interesting, and is that the hardest part with what you're talking about, carrying that and playing it, was when I was doing the workshop, because I was afraid to let go of her. I felt like I, it started with my audition process, and I initially was told I had an audition, like, the next day, and I was doing another workshop at Lincoln Center and I saw the material and I said I can't and so luckily I was able to be seen at a later point and I had like three consecutive days off and I was just starting to think about this character and to me the whole character was in the one piece of music I was given which was I read the first song she or aria in a way that she sings when she comes down and meets Giorgio I started to think about you know, she was this woman who had seizures and I was over, I was cramming research about seizures, different kinds of seizures and how some people, what it did to your body, how you, what afterwards, you know, how weak you were. And, and I kind of compared it to, I thought probably like, like the worst hangover I've ever had. 
where like every sound, every step, every every bit of light is too bright. And mm-hmm. just having to really, I mean, that wasn't the only <laughs> research. I, t- I didn't like actively get keep getting hung over to see. <laughs> I got to get drunk tonight and see how crappy I feel tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, the Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. No, I had to go way back to my silly younger days. But um, so when I was doing the work, when I got cast and when I was doing the workshop, there was a tension in her body that was very hard to let go of because I was really afraid. It was like I was under her spell and I was afraid I was going to lose her. I don't know that I consciously thought that, but I, looking back, I know that was going on. Once Mm -hmm. we were actually doing the production on Broadway, uh, the preview period was intense because we were rehearsing during the day and performing at night and often performing a different show than we were rehearsing during the day because you couldn't put in the new changes and it's the same with any show in previous. I'd had the time in between the workshop and the production, even though I was doing another show, Hello Again, at Lincoln Center, I was working with my voice teacher, Joan Later, because I said, look, Joan, I'm not going to compromise this woman's physical state. I want her to sing well and I, I need, we need for her to sing well, and Sondheim deserves that, <laughs> and the audience. But I need to know how to do that and be believable as this, this sick woman. And she mm-hmm. said, well, it's like everything else. It's like if you're going to carry attention in these parts of your body, you have to find some place that you're releasing it. And even being in the bed, we, you know, the work that went into the arrangement of the pillows... Mm. And the support that I had so that because, you know, she would say, you can't sing with your head back like this. You and I would say, but it has to look like that's what it is. So it just there were pillows of all shapes and sizes and different densities of, of foam and stuff that it was, you know, it takes a village to be able to make it look like I'm just doing it. So once the show was set and that didn't really happen until very close to opening the thing about this character is that she does end feeling loved and there was a catharsis it's not like i suddenly you know it's not quite beauty and the beast you know i I didn't look like a babe at the end if you will but i remember that in the finale where i've done i've died just a wacky, silly show. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, she, yes, she she passes away, but she, the, the finale is Giorgio sitting and writing and, uh, and writing and re- reading, actually, these letters. And he's reading a letter from her that was written right after he left, but before and after they'd been together, I mean, physically together, and they had admitted that he had said, I actually love you. And she died shortly thereafter. But she wrote him this letter. And he was reading that letter that talked about having been loved and having known what that feels like. I can let go. I really lived. I lived. I lived fully. I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. And I remember that the minute I read, I was reading that lyric and I was reading it bent over sort of tense, covering myself as she did. And as I was reading it, I literally started to just sit up straight. Mm. And I thought, she's going to stand up straight for the first time, except maybe in the flashback sequence to when she was a young girl. But even then, she's uncertain about many things in her life. And so just, and I, I actually had a red dress, and I had there was a release that happened. And when I walked off stage, off stage left at the then called Plymouth Theater, it was like everything dripped off of me. And also there was no intermission as we performed it. And that really helped too, because it wasn't about trying to maintain that energy through the, it was an hour and I think 40 minutes, which is a long time for an audience to sustain. But I get that uh, and particularly when I saw a production of it later on, that it's claustrophobic. You feel like you can't yeah. escape her. You can't escape this uh, this really difficult and complicated situation. So during the workshop, I had incredible headaches, and my whole body was 
not feeling well. And I tried to do stretching and yoga and didn't have the time for massages and that sort of thing. But, and I think if anybody had touched me, I would have like just like flown to the ceiling. But it was different when we were doing the show. I, and mm. interestingly enough, while I did that show, I did two workshops of other mu- new musicals during mm. the day, which you would think, how did you do anything? And I'm always very restful. But I, I could do that. It, with that show, it was set well in my voice. It was also built on me. You know, it ended up being built yeah. on my voice. And the pain that she suffered, which was considerable, and it was a very emotional show. I mean, I wept a lot in that show, and I felt all the feelings, as they say. But there was a release, and there's I, I know that that was the secret to why I was able to not feel like I was suffering through that time. And when it ended, I wasn't like, oh my God, I didn't know how I was going to make it. I have been in that situation, playing a character who looked like they were suffering much less than than, than (laughs) Bosco was. I have been like, oh dear God, please, let me just make it to the end. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Donna. Oh no. (laughs) No, 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 no. Not oh no. Not yet. Not yet. Not oh no yet. Okay. (laughs) You did the unprecedented when you played Dolly Levi for just the Tuesday night performances in the Bette Midler headlined 2017 Hello Dolly Broadway revival. And you said that the job came like at just the right time, right after the loss of your husband, actor Sean Elliott, because the show kept you working in New York close to your daughter, but was like a significantly lighter schedule. As we were preparing for this, and if it's not too personal, we were just really curious how did playing Dolly, who had was a widow of 10 years, like Mm -hmm. inform your own personal grieving process, you know, like Mm -hmm. it was so fresh at the time, like when you took on the role. Yeah. When I was asked to do it right after my husband died, literally a month and a half after he passed away, I was scheduled to be down in Richmond, Virginia, shooting the second season of Mercy Street for PBS. And we, when my husband was diagnosed in August of 2015 with stage four stomach cancer, you know, once he was out of the ICU and I knew I, we weren't going to lose him really fast. I mean, it was all too fast, but meaning that I could think about anything beyond just him surviving an emergency that happened very soon after he was uh, diagnosed. I'd been involved in all of the readings and workshops of uh, a musical, War Paint, playing Elizabeth Arden, and I was in negotiations to go to the Goodman and then to go to come to Broadway with Patty and the show. And I knew, I just kind of woke up and went, they were continuing to call about negotiating and I had to finally just tell my, my agent and manager at the time, this is what's happening with Sean and I don't see any scenario by which I can do this show. I'm not going to Chicago next summer. And they had arranged that timing because I said I couldn't go out of town except during the summer when my daughter was out of school. That's the only time I would do it. So that's what, cause we were going to have, it was going to happen earlier at the Goodman and I said, can't do it. So they switched some shows there to accommodate my schedule. It worked for Patty, but I said, if he's still with us, I'm not going to Chicago. We'll be here. That's that's not going to work. And and if he's not, I'm not doing eight shows a week on Broadway with my my grieving daughter uh, not having me around. So I was out of that. We and the producers there could not have been more gracious. And they ended up, I think, with the perfect person playing. I think Christine Ebersol was spot on casting for that part and beautiful. They were they're both amazing. And in the meantime. I knew Mercy Street, we'd shot a first season. We didn't have a green light for a second season. And I said, so what do we do about Mercy Street? Because that, you know, would probably start up next spring. And so I said, we can't keep it from them because word will get out. Like Mercy Street knew about war paint. And we were already talking about how we would work around each other's schedules. And so we have to be up front. And so they went and told one of the lead producers on it. And he said, you know, they're in the writer's room right now and they're writing for her character and I don't want to have them not write for her character and we'll figure it out. I'm just, I'm going to take responsibility here and just say, we'll figure that out. Of course, 
what did that mean? What did that mean to any of us? So suddenly, like while my husband was literally dying at home the last weeks of his life, I'm noticing these emails from the producer saying, uh, looks like we're going to get the green light and we'll, you, uh, we'll be setting you up with some costume fittings and blah, blah. And I just like called my manager agent and said, I can't even, I can't. And they knew what was happening with Sean. And they said, don't worry, we'll, we'll manage it. And managing it basically meant that once Sean was gone, I was going to have to figure out how I was going to do this job because they couldn't write her out. They couldn't replace me. Mm. So all that to say that I did it. My daughter and I got through it. It was traumatic in a way I would not wish on any child or their parent. She was traumatized by her husband, her husband, my husband, her father's death. And she was traumatized by the idea of me leaving the room. Forget about walking out of the house. Forget about getting on a plane and going to another state and not being at home at night with her. It was horrible. I had her down there with me as much as possible. I had family come down from Massachusetts and spend time with her. I had friends who stayed with her, friends who brought her down to be with me. I came back as much as possible. We did the best we could. And at the end of it, she and I took a little vacation down south. And and she said to me, Mommy, I'm really proud that we got through that. I'll never forget it. I was like, I'm beyond proud. And I'm, you know, we did the best we could. And she said, well, you just promised me, Mommy, that you won't go out of town again to work. I'm thinking, oh, dear God. And I said, you know what? I can promise you I will not go out of town for at least a year or two. And beyond that, I don't know. But I will never, I'm never going to go away for a long period of time and you're not with me. That's not happening. Because my husband and I, we, we always, one of us was always home. If the other was working out of town. And most of, you know, the reason I wasn't on stage much during the time for the six years prior to his death was that he was sick with other, you know, had another cancer, he had another illness. And so I had to limit, you know, I would take, I would say the vertical film and television shoots. I could work in Atlanta, I could work in Toronto, I could work in Richmond, Virginia, but don't, I'm not going to work in LA and I'm not going to work in Vancouver. I need to be able to get home quick if I need to. And mm-hmm. and I couldn't take a series regular on anything. I could only recur. So it was, you know, it, it was what it was. But in this situation, I was like, I have to work in New York. So I, what the gold ring to me was, I'm going to find an ensemble television series in New York. They're going to want me. I'm going to want them. It's going to happen. And I was t- like auditioning and testing for a number of things and, and all that summer after I finished Mercy Street and was back home and, and I needed to work, I needed money wise, I really needed to work. So none of those jobs came through. And like in the middle of pursuing another series that was shooting in New York, I will say it now, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and I would have been great as the mom, but so is, <laughs> <been funny. laughs> but anyway, yeah. but so was the incredible actress playing the mom. Marin. Um, Marin Hinkle, I think. Yeah. She's fabulous. She's wonderful. It wasn't meant to be mine, you know, and literally had come home from my second audition for that. And I'm still in my like 19, whatever it was, 50s or 60s hair look and lipstick and dress. And I get a message, call your manager and agent. Everybody needs to talk to you, you know, conference call immediately. And I'm like, wow, I I didn't think it went that well, but they're either saying you got to put Donna Murphy like into hiding for a while while until she pulls it back together or you got the job. I mean, that's what's going on here. And they said, okay, we need to talk to you. I'm like, oh God, it was that bad. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, the audition for Maisel. And they said, no, we haven't heard on that yet. And I'm like, oh, what is it? They tell me that they've been having this conversation for a while and Scott Rudin had come to them and blah, blah, blah. And nobody thought I would do it, but how could they not ask me? Because they kept saying, we need someone like Donna Murphy, somebody who's not going to seem like a B team bet, who's going to do their own thing. And nobody will really know exactly what that's going to be until it happens. And people kept bringing me up and Scott Rudin and other people kept saying, but she's not going to do that. She, you know, and then Bernie Telsey was casting director on it said, you know, she just turned down a play with us because, and she said she loved the play, but it was eight shows a week and she's not doing that while she's raising her daughter as a single mom. 
and her daughter's grieving and she's grieving. She's not doing it. So maybe we should ask because you never know. So they went to my agents and it was a month before my reps even came to me because they were just like, no, this is not what she's going to do at this moment in her career. And then they got, they were pursued and they came to a point where they realized, well, the money could be significant enough that it would carry her through this time anyway. And that would be worth something to her. And the time with her daughter would be extremely important. So they brought it to me. I remember I burst into tears because I was like, this is what it's come to. Like, I have to just go like show up at a theater once a week, which sounds like, oh, wow, easy peasy. But I love process. And I, I, I how, how could I create a character? And in the shadow of everyone's excitement about that, including mine, you know, I was like, oh, my God, that's brilliant. That's that's a reason to bring Hello, Dolly back to have Bette Mither play it. But I just I didn't see myself in the part. I didn't. And I realized I'd never seen the show. I'd seen parts of it, and I'd auditioned for Irene Malloy many times in my youth. <laughs> and I'd seen the movie, but to me it was just like Funny Girl 3 or something. Because it was just, oh, I love Barbara, I love Barbara. So I um, didn't pay a lot of attention to the storytelling. So when I you know, stopped crying and just said, you know, you know what, send me the script. It's always about, I have to read the script. Of course, the circumstances were very singular, and they would all require a lot of serious consideration but let me read the script and I start to read the script and I went oh shit she's a widow I forgot she's a widow I forgot what the whole friggin' story is and I just closed it and I went no and then I opened it back up and I kept reading and I went okay so she's and t- she's 10 years out so it really took a while because first of all I just thought the narrative on this business wise what is it saying for somebody who you know, worked hard and was here for a long time before I was starring in a Broadway show. And I was just negotiating to be one of the two stars above the title on a show and I had to pull out. And now I'm just going to be like an alternate to to an international icon. Let's, you know, tell the truth here and not have a process, which is everything to me in developing a character, because I'm not I'm not like a, a persona that I bring from role to role, which is a great thing if you've got that. But Mm -hmm. it's not, of course, I'm the vessel. I'm not an idiot. I know that. But I like transformation and I like... Yeah, you're chameleon. You know, I I love that. I love that. That's what keeps it exciting for me. And it's how I keep growing as a human, quite frankly. Or it's one of the ways I keep growing as a human. So obviously I ended up saying yes. And it came after I asked three maybe four, definitely three people I'm remembering right now who are very close to me, but from different areas of my life, but know me like in a, in a very sort of holistic whole way, not just me as an actress or not just, they, they understood a lot about my situation and my circumstances and who I was. And I told them all the situation, what was being presented and they all ended their conversation with me with some version of, well, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I think it's, could be just perfect but bottom line think you should do it if you get to control the narrative about why you're doing this what it is you're doing and that it's not you're not an understudy you know you're doing it at this moment and not not to play the violin and play a sob story but you know there's a priority in your life and it's raising your child but you would love to be on stage it's a wonderful show da, da, da. but that, that narrative needs to be clear And you have to get everything you need to make this work for your life. Because the only reason you're doing this job, or at least that that you're aware of right now, that you can know right now, is because of how it will fit with your life and give you what you need to take care of the most important thing in your life, which is your child and, and yourself as her mom. So that sort of happened. I mean, I there's now enough time that's passed and enough shit that has flown around in the world creatively a lot of it was very challenging but i loved the part and i loved my company and i had from the beginning had to say this is i'm not talking to sean when she talks to ephraim i'm talking to ephraim it's it is dolly and i did my usual 
deep dive autobiography that I wrote for her. So it was very specific. And I won't say that Ephraim didn't have a few things in common with Sean. (laughs) (laughs) But that became a very full person to me. And Dolly had been a widow for 10 years. I said yes when I'd been a widow for a few months. And when I actually started playing it, it had been a year and a few months that I was rehearsing it a year because I remember rehearsing it on my husband's birthday, rehearsing it Mm. on the anniversary of his death. I wasn't being paid at that point to rehearse it, but I was rehearsing it. Mm. Um, And I thought, you know, because I would just be crying through this whole thing. And that's not that's not what this is about. And the cast was so welcoming and so loving and so generous because they did the show with this great star and then they had to sort of figure out what it was like to, with the flow of a whole other person, a whole other energy, a whole other characterization. And they could not have been more loving, more generous coming right from the top with David Hyde Pierce, who was just like, am I the luckiest guy in the world to get to do this with Bette Midler and Donna Murphy? And I'm like, even just putting like Bette and I in the same sentence as, you know, someone you're happy to work with. He just, I can't say enough about him and the whole Gavin Creel, Kate Baldwin, Taylor, Beanie, right down to every member of the ensemble who were all stars. And they would say, not in a way that was in any way knocking their other nights. They'd go, oh, good, it's Tuesday night. Donna's here. This how, We're going to have a different kind of fun, you know, just a different kind of yeah. show tonight. But it was the producer did not treat me very well. Mm. And the things were not handled as they'd been told, I'd been told they would be handled. And I was not treated nicely and I was in no at another time in my life honestly I would have left Mm. I would not have allowed myself to be treated that way but I I couldn't I had to support my daughter by the time this treatment started happening it wasn't when we were first having our conversations it was when I was officially in rehearsal and getting close to having to do the show and it was like I have to do this But at another time in my life, I would have quit and said, you know what, that is your problem. I'm sorry, but you can't, if you're going to treat me like this. Mm. You know, we've all found out things about this particular producer who, you know, he's not treated other people well. And I think that's his own struggle and his own journey in life. And I had to figure out with the help of a very good therapist who I was working with, (laughs) thank God for her, you know, okay, be clear about why you're going to work. Be clear about what you need to do to, if someone's not making you feel welcome in their home, how you make yourself at home there so that you can do your job. And Mm. that's what I did. And let me tell you, it was an incredible gift, as hard as a lot of it was, because I experienced a kind of joy playing that character that there's no other way that in the year following my husband's death, my partner of 36 years, I would have been like having a kind of happiness that was just bursting out of every pore of my body unless I was playing Dolly Levi. So complicated answer because it was a complicated situation. Yeah. You know? Thank you for being so honest about it also, mm-hmm. because I feel You're like welcome. that production was really lovely in spite of all of the horrors behind the scenes. And yeah. I feel like New York was so happy to have you there. And I feel um, like people were just so fucking excited to have you on stage. And it was its own thing. Right. It was its own event. And that was really special. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I did feel that. And, and it was an incredible gift. I felt, I think, a lot less lonely during that time. You spoke to this a little bit, but... The character of Dolly, as you said, is sort of like this larger than life persona. And also it's been played by people of that ilk, like Carol Channing, Pearl Bailey, Ethel Merman, Barbara Streisand, Bette Midler, of course. So when Damien and I interviewed Broadway's own original mini Faye, the great Sandra Lee on this show. You know, she was my teacher at at the Stella Adler Conservatory. Uh, She said you're an incredible actor. Yes. And she was just like, is Donna the monstrous, which is how she like 
talked about Carol Channing. She was like, Carol Channing was a cipher. She was a monstrous. She just kept saying it over and over. And she was like, Donna is an incredible actor, but she's like a chameleon. It's a very different thing. Her dolly is going to be very different. So can you talk, like you talked a little bit about how you were bringing something different to the role, but I was just so obsessed with the fact that Sandra was so into you as an actor, but was like, Aww. she's not a monster the way that Carol <laughs> Channing was. <laughs> I, you know, she when she came to see the show, we sat in my dressing room for two hours after afterwards and just oh. i have i have photos uh, i should send them to you they're unbelievable um she's unbelievable so yeah. how did i approach it i i went to the source i read the matchmaker yeah and i went oh and that helped sort of it was like the the window was very fogged up with all the i you know with carol and 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 Barbara and even the idea of Ethel Merman and Phyllis Diller and, and I mean, Ginger Rogers and Pearl, <laughs> and, 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 you know, like, yeah. Pearl Bailey. And it just, as you said, these are just like women who walk in a room and it's like, hello, or <laughs> I don't mean they all do the same thing. They don't do, they yeah. do their thing. I think, you know, part of what was challenging for the powers that be was that, I didn't walk into the room with that character, even though I told him from the beginning, if you're hiring me, you know, and the reason you're saying you want to hire me, all those things also translate into, I don't have that. I don't start with that, you know, because if I, st- right. if I started with it, then we'd already know where it's going to end up, but I don't know where it's going to end up. And it took me a while, but the audiences told me a lot. They, t- yeah. they always do. They always do. Okay, Donna, a lot of our listeners will certainly know you for your supporting role as Juliet Simone in the iconic 2010 (laughs) drama about the fictional American Ballet Academy Center stage. I love this movie so much. (laughs) They put you up for the role of the ballet teacher, but you thought you should be up for the Deborah Monk mother character. You've always said, like, you're an actor who moves well, and you'd only do it if they filmed you from the waist up and put you in dance classes. How open to that collaboration were they? I mean, they gave you the role. Um, and like, what did ballet boot camp actually entail? Like, how long <laughs> was it? What was it? Yeah. So, yeah. So they, they called me to audition for that, for, for Juliet. And I read the script and I said, what are they crazy? I'm reading, she jetes across the room. She da 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 da. She's demonstrating all this stuff. And I, so I called my agent manager and I said, you know, I can't do that. So... I uh, went in in the morning for Juliet, and I see. I chatted with the wonderful Nicholas Heitner, who was our, our director and is a brilliant theater director as well. But we'd never met. I'd just been a great fan of his and the madness of King George. I mean, he's a, he's a genius. So he's a genius. So I figured when I tell the man, look, Nick, I can't do what the script says I need to do. And he's like, oh, you're not giving yourself enough credit, darling. You're, you're, a, you're a dancer. I know you're a dancer. I said, I'm not. I'm really not. And he said, whatever. Okay, just, just do the work. Do the work. So I you know, did the scenes. And he said, you know, you really don't need to come back for the other part later. And I said, oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> and so I did. And I did my audition for that. And he said, well, you're great. You're, you're wonderful. You'd be wonderful in both parts, but well, well, we'll be in touch. And I left and I had an offer very quickly to play Juliet Simone. And I was like, what are they thinking? So then I said, let me talk to Nick. And is there any kind of a dance consultant who's on the show already or a choreographer who's on the show? And I mean, on the film and I talked to Nick and he said, let me have you talk to, and it was, um, Kurt. Kurt was his first name. But he was a ballet master at at one of the ballet companies. And I talked to him and I said, I'm not a dancer. He said, yes, but Nick said that you just carry yourself like a dancer. And he said, what I can tell you is that a lot of the women who are in the position that Juliet is in would not be full out demonstrating the choreography. They do a lot with their hands, they have somebody who they have demonstrated, they correct port de bras, they correct positioning. And so what we did is we worked super hard on the port de bras, which is really your arms and, and the waist up. And and a bit, yeah, you know, it's not like I wore like 
I don't know, Timberland boots and, you know, <laughs> I don't know, something completely inappropriate from the waist down in rehearsal or in, in, in the filming situation. I approached it as a whole body, but I knew that what had to be as letter perfect as possible was that. And that was not easy because I don't come from that world. But we worked really hard and, and the greatest compliment I could ever have received on a first day where I had to be in a classroom situation where I am correcting a lot of the core, the, the core dancers were dancers with ABT, dancers with SAB. And there I am saying, no, darling, <laughs> this is, <laughs> oh my God. So I was so nervous. I think that was my first day of shooting was a classroom scene. The one where I tell Ava to, you know, get rid of the gum and she swallows it. At least she didn't spit it into my hand. That's all I can say. Um, <laughs> so so good. I remember one of the, the girls, first one, and then, and then a, a group of them followed saying, oh my God, you remind me so much of my teacher. Where did you study? Where did you dance? And I was just like, oh my God. Nailed it. We did it. <laughs> It is iconic, and it is iconic, I think, especially for our generation as well. So, like, I, when I remember being like, Donna Murphy's a Broadway star. She, like, I didn't know you from Broadway at that <laughs> right. time in my life yet. And, and so, like, it feels so, I'm so happy that it's, like, filled with you and Deborah Monk and Peter Gallagher and uh, yeah, like, all exactly. of these theater actors, again, Phil, and, yeah. uh, like, Mary Ann Plunkett is, like, is Jody's mom. It's, like, so wonderful that all yeah. of these theater actors are there. Yeah, it was, it was another, like, really joyful set to go to. Totally joyful. Yeah. Okay, Donna Murphy, we have now entered the part of the show. This is rapid fire. We're going to get out of your hair and let you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. This is rapid. So we're going to throw stuff at you all all over the place. It's rapid. You got to answer rapid fire, baby. Oh, okay. You can see. <laughs> I'll bet you're guessing just how good I'm going to be at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'll start us off. Who was more intimidating, Stella Adler or Stephen Sondheim? Stella Adler. Okay, I believe it. Okay, I actually like Brooke Shields and thought she did a solid job of replacing you in Wonderful Town, but why did she get the recording? She also got a re-recording when she replaced Rosie in Greece. Was that in her contract? What the fuck? I have no idea what was in her contract, but I know that... Oh, I can't say it. It's not a... <laughs> It's not about Brooke. It's just, let's just say there was there were some screw-ups in my Wonderful Town contract, okay? Let's okay. just say that. This is a problem. This is a problem. Okay. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> but, that, but that has nothing to do with Brooke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, she okay? seems like a lovely person. She seems like a she's, lovely person. she's a gem. Yeah. Okay, Donna, you can act, sing, dance, do dialects, scat, cry at the drop of a dime, perform in period or contemporary pieces, and do a pretty good Louis Armstrong. <laughs> what is Donna Murphy shitty at? Jetting across the room. <laughs> <laughs> I love a callback. Call <laughs> and I don't know, cooking regularly. That's fine. That's fine. Who needs it? Okay. <laughs> Donna Murphy, tell us about sitting on stage in that Stephen Sondheim's 80th birthday concert. One, how did they decide on red and did you get to choose your dress? Two, how intense was it to sit on stage for everyone's songs and then have to sing your own in front of the man himself? And three, who of the women on that stage was your closest buddy? Audra, Marin, Patty, Bernadette, or Elaine? Okay, so first of all, the red dresses, right? Yeah. Lonnie yeah. had seen some concert. It was not a Sondheim salute. It was some other concert where he saw a group of leading women in red dresses. So he had this red dress idea in his head and to focus on women who had been leading women in, in Steve's, on Steve's shows and for them to come on together. So the red, that was all him, it was red. And he said, and Diane von Furstenberg is going to design the dresses for all of you. And I'm yeah. like, great. And all I can say is didn't quite work out that way across the boards. Uh, let's see, what shall I say? There may have been some designed, but I know that I went down, they basically said, here are some dresses, here are some red dresses. So try them, try these on. And, um, and then I remember like, I went, Oh, I really love this. And they said, oh, I think Audra likes that one. I'm like, then why did you have me try it on? Well, she hasn't right. made her decision yet. Okay. And then I would try another one on. And I'd say, could this maybe be adjusted a little bit? And they said, no, we really can't do any major adjustments on it. If it's just like a hammer, I was like, okay. So then 
they they said maybe we'll pull out some vintage stuff and so they they did find a vintage dress for me that was really cool it had like just this like halter thing with a big bejeweled section it was very yeah. simple like column greek goddess kind of dress but it needed some work and all i know is that both myself and audra were being sewn into our dresses as the orchestra was playing the introduction to beautiful girls and oh david God. hyde pierce was about to sing here are the, the hats off here they come we were in the dressing room still and i was like walking past audra and i was like i'm taping it i'm taping it i had like double top stick tape because i and, and i can't don't ask me what was still not working with my dress but I said, I'm just, and she's like, well, they, I don't know. They got a needle and thread. There's a needle and thread right near me. I'm not moving until that's finished. <laughs> but we made it on stage. And in the meantime, like Patty had somebody else. She said she wasn't happy. And so with, uh, uh, I wear a lot of Diane von Furstenberg's clothing. So I'm not knocking Diana, believe me. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. that situation was not like what everybody dreamed it would be. And, and yet... It was gr greater than anything you could have ever dreamed it would be. But yeah. Elaine, I don't know where that red suit came from. That hat was not a Diana <laughs> von yeah. hat. Yeah. But I think that, but Marin's was that gorgeous, gorgeous Marin, God rest her soul, was in a DVF and Audra was in a DVF and Bernadette was in a DVF. And so was I. So still, most of us were yeah. in that. Um Best buddy on the stage, Marin. Marin is like yeah. a sister to me. She uh, sang at my daughter's, when we adopted my daughter, Darmia. We had a welcoming ceremony at the chapel, at the UN chapel, and Marin sang this beautiful Maury Eston song, New Words, mm. with a guitar accompaniment. And she was with me when we brought her to, sing, to see Santa for the first time. And she really is one of my best friends. And... I miss her beyond, beyond. She also is just like one of the most hilarious and grounded, you know, she was like a goddess. She was just like oh, fucking salt of the earth, you know, yeah. and the, and so supportive and loving of everybody, everybody. But I also loved all those women on that stage. It was it intimidating and a little nerve wracking. I can't even say the word nerve wracking. <laughs> Let me put the teeth back in. Okay, <laughs> nerve, nerve wracking. Um, yeah, but I try to just truly be in the moment of what it was. I thought, look, you've done your work. You can't be sitting here like running your lyrics while Audra McDonald is singing Glamorous Life. It just, you can't. I, I physically was not capable of it because I just would be so drawn in. And then, you know, my Marin, and I can't remember the order of it. So I, I was happy that I was able to do that, to really be in that moment and in each moment. And we got to do it two nights. So mm -hmm. I, I think mine is like all from one night that I remember Lonnie saying, you know, we just went with the first night or whatever. But knowing you had one more shot at it was also psychologically a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You knocked it out of the park. It's so good. It's classic. Oh, thank you. I love that night so much. It was amazing. I remember after the second concert, there was a gathering over at what used to be O'Neill's. I don't, I, I don't know mm. what it is at this point, but we all were just exchanging these stories. And you felt like you were a member of the most honorable organization, club, you know, with the most remarkable people who all got to work with the most remarkable person and and we're sharing these stories that expand like me going up to mandy and saying oh my god i remember being at what was supposed to be your last performance of sunday in the park and i was i was going to leave the business and my husband got me tickets to that show and i swear it was knowing that once i saw that show i would not be able to leave and it, what he meant in my life. I had met Mandy before that. I'd even done a little work with him, but that conversation happened and other conversations like that. And it was all because of Steve. Everybody's lives had changed because yeah. of Steve. And then we celebrated him together and it was amazing. Yeah. It's an incredible night. 
Okay, Donna Murphy, last question. What's more fun, dying slowly on stage as Fosca or dying a grand explosive death as Doc Ock's wife Rosie in Spider-Man 2? Fun. <laughs> well, I made more money dying Rosalie's death. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even though it's a very small part in the movie. <laughs> It's iconic. People remember it. People remember that death. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Donna Murphy, this has been like truly illuminating, a delight. We are so lucky to have you. Thank oh. you so much for being on. You might know her from with us today. My pleasure. Truly. You guys are great. Okay. Two things that I was really obsessed with and took away from this interview with Donna Murphy was, one, how amazing that she got to be a one-night-only cover for Audrey in the original off-Broadway production of Little Shop of Horrors. I mean, Mm. I have to say, like, when I first heard it, I was like, oh, I don't think of her at all as an Audrey type, which, like, who, what is that? I don't know. Like, Ellen Green is such a specific type of actor, and Donna Murphy is such a chameleon, but... There's this great video on YouTube where she's talking to Alan Menken. He's like sort of talking to all of the women who have brought to life so much of his music. And she tells this little anecdote about going in for Audrey as a cover one night. And she does like a very little bit of somewhere that's green. And I was like, she's so fucking grit. Good. She can do anything. And like, I really do. You know, the older I get, I really respect actors that can like do the thing that they do. Like I respect Julia Roberts and Jennifer Aniston for being able to do the thing that they do, which is like some version of themselves. But like, yeah, also I am obsessed with actors that can be anything. And Donna Murphy is a person who can be anything. And how cool is that that she can be like a witchy crone and then she can be like high class and then low class and she's sexy and like she's like all of the- And she's the ballet teacher. Like she looks like a fucking dancer in center stage. Her carriage is yes. exquisite. That was the other thing I was gonna say that I was obsessed with the idea that she was like, I'm not right for this role and like they clearly wanted her and then she was like, well this is how we're gonna do it then because I will not, you're not gonna have me looking like Boo Boo the Fool here, you know? <laughs> right, I'd like the Deborah Monk role please. <laughs> I love her so much. I just think her talent is so unmatched. And she also just seems to be from all accounts, like a really generous human was so kind to us and so forthcoming, really honest and transparent about so much, including Wonderful Town, which I think was like a tricky time for her. She alluded to that when she was talking about (laughs) her contract and the Brooke Shields re-recording. And also the entire story of doing Hello Dolly in the wake of her husband's death and the Scott Rudin experience. I just feel like she was so forthcoming and forthright and just just like a real human that leads with this is sounds so cheesy but like leads with like love and kindness but also is real like was like it fucking sucked and I would have fucking left that show at any other point in my career because I didn't work this hard for 30 years to like be at this point right now and I was like that's so honest people really don't talk like that certainly at her level and it was so fucking refreshing and I love you Donna Murphy we love you Donna we'll see you at City Center folks we love you we hope you love us i mean if you're still tuning in we really appreciate it um if you want to keep up with the shit that we're talking about you know like the spice girls uh, ranked in vocal order or you know whatever <laughs> sort of nonsense we're posting follow us on social media you can find me at damian bellino and you can find my beautiful and tall cohort at road man that's r-o-d-e-m-a-n-n-e and while you're at it please follow that new you might know her from instagram and that is at you might know her from know her from is produced by us that's right me Anne rodeman and my best friend damien bellino we do all of it right here for you because it's what we love it's our passion project and we want to thank our consultants at grumpy entertainment the wonderful jason jude hill and daniel sears of course all of the editing you hear in your ear holes is courtesy of the great daniel sears and special shout out to Gang. Gang is three-fourths women. Gang is from Philadelphia. And all that music you hear in each and every episode of You Might Know Her From is by Gang. You can stream and download Gang's music wherever you listen to your tunes. And if you need to see that clip of fucking Warren Beatty at midnight on TCM, <laughs> I guarantee you it is worth your time. It's so dark and weird and beautiful. Of course, that goes in the show notes. I put it at the bottom of every episode description so we can catalog each and every minutia esoterica that we talk about on this show. You're very welcome. So one of the things we did for my birthday was we clipped. We watched musical theater clips, some favorite clips. 
And I was just obsessed with this clip of Barbara Streisand directing Daisy Ridley and Anne Hathaway in the booth <laughs> for... It was for her, like, duets album, like, duets with celebrities. I was just obsessed with it. And I, like, the takeaway was that she seemed very charmed by Daisy Ridley. And we were like, why is she, like, really into Daisy, but maybe less into Anne Hathaway? And I think, what was yeah. the takeaway, Anne? I think the takeaway was that like Anne is actual competition. Do you know what I mean? Like Anne is a movie star that has charisma. And I think Daisy is like, was a star Wars star that hasn't broken through into other mediums yet. And actually I really do love Daisy Ridley. I think she's very charming and smart and funny, but Anne Hathaway is like a bona fide Oscar winning musical for a musical movie star. And I think Barbara said, I can smell it on her. You know, I think I think she could. But watching Barbara Streisand direct them in the booth is just one of my favorite things. She has this line and she just says, beautiful, beautiful, a thing of beauty. And it's iconic to me. It's like that sound rings in my ears sometimes when I'm falling asleep. And I just, I just, it tickles me. Also, her, her fucking autobiography is coming out. It's like 1,048 pages, and it's not long enough. I am so <laughs> excited. I am so fucking excited for the book. Thank God. I hope that she drags every single person from beginning to end. Oh, I love Do her so much. Do you think she will? Yeah. I think she does not give a fuck. <laughs> if you go to the Barbara Streisand archives, I actually found this really interesting thing. We're going to put it on the Instagram. But she has like very detailed notes of like every aspect of her career on her website. And there's the whole story of Lainey Kazan, former guest of this show who we love so much that went on for one night in the original Broadway production of funny girl. And the way that the story is told on her website is extremely unflattering to Lainey Kazan. And I was like, this is like a choice. It's like watermarked with her official <laughs> like website. And I was like, she obviously approved of this. She would not let this be on her official website if she did not approve of the copy that they used, which was like, some of it was kind of nasty. And I was like, I think Barbara Streisand doesn't care. She's in another tier. She doesn't exist on the mortal plane. Yeah, like, she's not in the human level. Like there are a few people that are on her level. It's like who? I don't know. It's like Oprah. It's like Meryl Streep. Right. Like those are the people that right. she like. And does. like Anne Hathaway is an actual competition. No. Do you know what I mean? But there was something there where she was like, I don't like what I don't like this. I don't like this. And I respect it. Honestly, I think she's earned the right to say whatever the fuck she wants at this point. I love her.